quote mining, uh, I'm going to begin with an example, quite a well-known one, from Charles Darwin. Darwin, faced with the complexity of the eye, said, to suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection, seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. Well, that famous quotation was always going to be a prime candidate for quote mining, omitting, of course, the words that immediately follow it. Yet reason tells me. <laughs> I think you know it. Um, and you can read it anyway. Using Yahoo's search engine, I have just searched the World Wide Web for I freely confess absurd in the highest degree and obtained 2,890 hits. For comparison, I then searched for if numerous gradations from a perfect and complex I, which is from the following passage, and obtained only 1,550 hits. The former phrase has been quoted nearly twice as often as the latter. Let's call this a mining index of two. It's actually quite a modest mining index. The Cambrian explosion, as you probably know, is an event in the history of life, in the fossil history, in which it appears that about half a billion years ago, a little bit more, most of the great animal phyla rather suddenly appear in the fossil record. Needless to say, creationists love it because it looks to them as though that was, there was nothing before that. These phyla just suddenly sprang into existence. In The Blind Watchmaker, I wrote, I was young and foolish in those days and not aware of the potential for quote mining. I wrote that, that the majority of animal phyla, we find them, quote, already in an advanced state of evolution the very first time they appear. It is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. I went on to say, needless to say, this appearance of sudden planting has delighted creationists. Well, I was savvy enough, evidently, to realize that creationists would love it, but not, in 1986, savvy enough to know that they would gleefully quote my lines back at me in their own favor, carefully admitting what followed, which was a rather lengthy explanation of the Cambrian explosion and about how, in fact, it must have been preceded by a very long period of evolutionary history. I went on to say, evolutionists of all stripes believe, however, that this really does represent a very large gap in the fossil record. Well, I uh, did my quote mining index calculation on this as well. Uh, I took the phrase, it is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. I subjected that phrase to Yahoo's search engine and got 1,250 hits. I then looked at the next bit. <laughs> Evolutionists of all stripes believe, however, that this really does represent a very large gap in the fossil record and got 63 hits. This gives a mining index, 1250 divided by 63 of nearly 20, 19.8. I want now to introduce a special kind of quote mining, which I think you'll recognize uh, when you see it. I call it mining the Eddington concession. Sir Arthur Eddington was a famous British astronomer and, uh, I've, and also a popularizer of science. I've used this quotation often for other purposes. I'm going to read it one more time. Eddington was trying to emphasize the unique, almost, importance of the second law of thermodynamics, and he chose to do it in this way. If someone points out to you that your pet theory of the universe is in disagreement with Maxwell's equations, then so much the worse for Maxwell's equations. 
if it is found to be contradicted by observation, well, these experimentalists do bungle things sometimes. But if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can offer you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. <laughs> Notice the rhetorical device that Eddington is using here. Clearly, he wasn't seriously intending to cast doubts on Maxwell's equations, nor on the competence of experimental physicists. Precisely the opposite. Eddington's manifest respect for Maxwell's theorizing and for experimental, experimental physicists was designed to highlight his final extolling of the unbudgeable veracity of the second law of thermodynamics. That rhetorical device is what I am naming the Eddington concession. If a journalist, say, reading the Eddington quotation announced to the world that Sir Arthur Eddington is skeptical of Maxwell's equations, or Sir Arthur Eddington thinks experimental physicists are all bunglers. That would be mining the Eddington concession.